everybody. Uh, great to see you again here. And today I have a special guest that I will introduce in just a moment. Um, we're neighbors, so we're both here in Boulder, Colorado, and just have been friends for quite a while, do similar things. But I always learn from my colleagues, and today we're going to talk about biotoxin illness. So I will introduce Dr. Terry Fox in just a moment. Um, but before I do, just a few basic housekeeping things. Um, you all probably know by now we have a YouTube channel and a podcast that's going live. And so you can listen to this and all of my previous episodes there. If you just go to YouTube and search my name, Jill Carnahan, you will find that. And I would love to have you subscribe so you get notified if I do new interviews. Um, you can also find me on the website, jillcarnahan.com. Lots and lots of free resources. And if you're listening and you don't get my newsletter, you're missing out. I've got tons of free stuff, um, blogs, recipes, um, products, all kinds of uh, things. And it uh, comes out weekly. And of course, we never share your information. Um, the retail site is drjillhealth.com. And you can find our mold detox box there, which you might talk about mold today with biotoxin illness and uh, many other things. So welcome, Dr. Terry Fox. It is great to have you here, neighbor and friend. Um, I want to introduce you formally, and then I will ask you to tell us a little bit about your journey into functional medicine. So let me grab um, your bio here. So Dr. Terry Fox, originally from Virginia, uh, she went to James Madison University, where she completed her undergrad degree in 1991, and later served as the director of health care and health education for the, God, the God's Child Project in Antigua, Guatemala. Um, this project provided educational scholarships for street kids and orphans from the guerrilla wars. This is where she received her inspiration to go to medical school. In 1996, she began medical school at the University of California, Southern San Francisco, where she simultaneously trained in botanical medicine. So definitely want to hear more about that today, Terry. Um, she studied with several master herbalists. She practices um, how do you say this, Surya meditation? Oh, Surya. Thank you. Okay, sorry. An ancient transcendental meditation that comes from the Vedic scripture. Dr. Fox moved to Boulder in 2001, where she did her internship at St. Anthony's Family Medicine Program in Denver. And after internship, she completed her board certification in integrative and holistic medicine. She then trained in functional medicine and now integrates Western, natural, botanical, and functional medicine at her practice in Boulder. Dr. Fox, thank you for spending time with me today. I'm delighted thank to have you here. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And I start everyone out with kind of how did you get here? We heard like the formal story, but there's always a little piece of heart and soul. And it sounds like with Guatemala, that was like a life-changing adventure. So how did you get from Guatemala to functional medicine in Boulder? Okay, that was kind of a long road. Um, so... Um, I had not planned to go to medical school. I was studying international studies in college. And um, I went and lived in, I was volunteering in Guatemala with street kids and orphans from the Gadilla Wars. Um, and basically we had a educational scholarship program where um, the kids could, um, we put them in school they mostly were living in the trash dump, so they were homeless and we had families kind of um, that would take them in and we'd pay them a stipend and then we'd put them in school and if they kept their grades up, they won their scholarship. And so we started, we're trying to break the chain, the circle of poverty by getting them educated. Um, and so I was in charge of uh, healthcare and health education for this wow. nonprofit in Guatemala. And um, I lived there for two years. Um, I loved it. It was probably two of the best years of my life. And I'll never forget all these kids that I worked with. They, they were just the sweetest things in the world. And um, I was planning to get my master's in public health. Mm -hmm. And I worked with all these um, doctors and residents and med students who came down to volunteer for the project and um, you know, got inspired by what they could do. And then also I had a mentor who was one of my greatest heroes that was doing the most beautiful work. And she was an MD and she sort of took time out of what mm -hmm. she was doing to sit me down and say, all right, what are you doing with your life? Where are you going? And I was like, me? She, you can't. Yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> you know, and I told her what I wanted to do and what my dream was. And she was like, you got to go to med school. And I was like, you're crazy. And she yeah. was like, what, what's your holdup? And I was like, I don't even like blood. 
And she, you know, she's like, you'll get over that in the first two minutes. It's fine. That has to do with that. If you want to, you know, make an impact in the world and be able to do third world medicine and, you know, make big changes, you're going to need your, you know, you're going to need to go to med school. So I came home um, Mm -hmm. from Guatemala and I hadn't done any of my science prerequisites. So I had a couple of years in my twenties of doing all the sciences and all the prereqs. And I sort of was doing it like if it, if if I like it and it flows and it goes well, then okay. But if not, forget it. I'm getting remastered from public health. And it was kind of like my way was pretty lit from there. Like everything worked out Mm. beautifully and I did really well and, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I really sort of wanted to go to naturopathic school because that's what resonated with me more um, than the allopathic uh, model. Um, And I think in the end, I just decided that if I went to naturopathic school, I can't necessarily integrate the Western and do all of it. But if I did the I could handle the Western and get through med school and your training. You can integrate the naturopathic and the functional and the holistic and all of that later. So, so yeah, so I did it. Wow. I love that. So similar because I remember thinking I had the heart of a naturopath and like I looked at chiropractic, naturopathic, traditional Chinese medicine, and that resonated a hundred percent, but then very similarly, and I did a little mission work in Honduras. It was a shorter, way shorter stint, but so similar in that I was like, if I ever want to do anything like that, the allopathic medicine model is really a little easier to actually like practice medicine in another country or um, and so I joke about, I like infiltrated the system <laughs> and you did yeah. too. We both like, cause we, we have these hearts that are way bigger in scope and yeah. um, how we approach it and probably in philosophy too. But I'm so glad we did because I feel like I got a great education and I don't, it's not like I tossed that out. I feel like that's the foundation of great diagnostic skills. And then um, we add to it, our toolbox is bigger, which is amazing. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So today we're going to dive into biotoxin illness. And first of all, I want to just define for you as listening biotoxins. We put this big kind of garbage basket term that includes mold. That's one of the primary biotoxins, but this can also be from Lyme and um, Babesia, Bartonella, Ehrlichia, all these other infections. It could be from really anything biologically that is a toxin. So from infections or from the environment, and these things cause a lot of havoc in the body. But what I'd love to know next is how did you get into biotoxin illness? Do you have a story and experiences that brought you this direction? Yeah. Um, so I was, um, you know, drawn to functional medicine um, after residency and, you know, did all, all that functional medicine um, conferences and loved it, not resonated, you know, along with my botanical medicine background, but the looking for the underlying dysfunction instead of treating the cause. And, and I, in my mind, like functional medicine kind of took the natural world and the herbs and everything I'd studied and all the stuff that you knew and like got really gritty into the science and the evidence with it. And it was that combo that I was like, oh, it is exactly what I, I need. Cause I, I like the, the woo woo stuff as well, mm-hmm. but not necessarily always in practice and, you know, like that. So the functional medicine was great. Um, and so I was doing functional medicine. My, uh, my brother, I'm from Virginia. So a very Lyme endemic region. My brother mm-hmm. first got Lyme. That was kind of my first you know, looking into it from functional medicine, holistic medicine, and learning just like a tiny. And then, um, and then I don't know if you had this experience too, but like doing functional medicine for fatigue and sleep and headaches and everything, all these, you know, chronic illnesses that we deal with, I felt like in the beginning, like maybe 80% of my patients got better and 20% of them just wouldn't. You, yes. You work on the adrenals, you work on the hormones, you get them sleeping and they don't budge. And those all sort of turned out to have Lyme. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of got me into the Lyme world. And then my son um, got really, really sick when he was nine. I think it started when he was eight years old and it kind of looked, it, it was, it was sort of gradual. Like he was this really like just thrill seeking, fearless maniac, really active little boy. 
And um, suddenly he started like he was stiff when he'd get up and he'd stiff when he'd get out of the cars. Wow. He'd start walking down the, the stairs sideways. And I'd be like, do your knees hurt? What's going on? And then he'd go, no. And he'd walk down them normal. And I knew something was not right, but he would kind of deny that anything hurt. And so I started like doing simple things on him. Like maybe it's a gluten, like maybe it's a food sensitivity. And, you know, I started wanting it to the last thing I ever wanted was for it to be Lyme. Cause those were yeah. at that point I was treating Lyme and those yeah. were all my patients. Yeah. And so of course it's in the back of my head and I'm terrified of it. I don't want to test him for it yet. So eventually I test him for it and it's positive. He's a CDC positive wow. Lyme as, wow. as do I, not just at yeah. Um, <clears throat> and um, I ended up taking him to see Dr. Harris. Have you met Steve Harris in, in California? He was, yeah. So um, he uh, treated him and um, he was amazing. And he said, you have to get him tested for mold. And this is Jill, seven years ago, wow. seven or eight years ago, when, and a Lyme doc knew to test him for mold first. And he was like, he gave me one of the, I think old school, like real time labs, you know, I did no provocation. I just had yeah. a it, and, you know, and then sent it in and it was through the roof. Um, and so we had no, I mean, I had hints. There was weird smells, musty smells. I'd had people in and I had people tell me everything was fine. Yes. You know, there's parts of the story that are actually kind of relevant for a lot of patients. Cause mm -hmm. one of the things that happened was once I figured out like that the mold on him was positive and I was trying to figure out where it was in the house, I had one person out to test the house and they found there was like a water leak, just a small little water leak in the attic space above his bedroom. Uh, and they were like, oh, you just got to get that fixed. And I was like, okay. Uh -huh. So we actually went out of the country, the whole family for two weeks. And I had it fixed when I was gone and I got back and he got so sick. Oh, he so was in nine out of 10 pain. Wow. He didn't get out of bed for six months. Wow. Because he had this like horrific, like migraine that just didn't let up no matter what I did for six months. Wow. And, you know, now looking back, you could tell me exactly what happened, right? Yes. They yes. fixed the water leak, but they opened up the That's attic. They blew up. They went everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that remediation meant this whole other thing. Um, and so then he got, he got, yeah, it was awful. So then I got sick, he was sick. And um, I ended up finding somebody, a mutual colleague who, you know, John Bodie yeah. um, from Mold Pros, uh -huh. who I think Dr. Hooper from Real Time gave me his name. Oh, neat. It's all these <laughs> yeah. yeah, Dr. Hooper gave me his, his name many, many years ago. And I called him and he came and he looked at the house and uh, he cut a hole in the vapor barrier. So in our crawl space, this was in 2013. Wow. So now it's 2014, but it's right after the floods. And yeah. we thought we were clean from the floods. Mm -hmm. And he cut the vapor barrier and there was three feet of water under our entire house. Oh and my goodness. no idea. Yeah. So and Henry, I'll just pause here because there's some really important things. First of all, you and I are doctors. And so we know this, we know better. And we know, now we know a lot about mold back then we didn't, but right. this is so common. And then for a patient who doesn't have any idea, it's like, it's the, um, it's not the exception to the rule. And what you just said earlier about the remediation, fixing the water leak without containing and then taking care of the dust after remediation. I want to clarify for those people listening, this is such a key because even a great remediation, if you have dust in your HVAC system and debris around the house from previous before it was fixed and you don't clean that, that dirt, debris, dust, dead mold will still cause reactions. People get worse. They think yeah. they take care of it and then they get worse. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. you blow it up. I was thinking like you blew it up, you opened yeah. it up. Yeah, so yeah. keep yeah. going. I didn't mean to interrupt. When you so. disturb it, it lets off. Yes. It. But that's what it does when it's so angry. Actually, it this is important. It's nanoparticles. Yes. yes. And they go into the fibers of your drywall and your wood and yes. everything. And your books and your clothing and everything. Yeah. yeah. And they don't tell me that. 
Exactly. Part of this is like this behind a wall, you know, like stack your ketomium, some of the worst of the black taxi molds. They're yeah. sticky, they're wet, they like dark spaces. So they will often be undisturbed behind a wall with no visible evidence. I can't tell you the number of people who've said, I've had an inspector, one, two, three, four, they all say everything's clean, kind of like you. And yeah. yet I know from their physical history, there almost has to be a mold issue. Yeah. So but then when you open that cavity, you are letting all you know what break loose because it then explodes and contaminates your entire environment. And so sometimes say, you know, there's an issue behind the wall, you are better off to wait and not do anything until you know you can get the right remediation in there and the cleaning. Totally great. Because otherwise, yeah. People that I've said, don't even, don't even. And don't do it yourself, it. right? No, <laughs> don't fix it. I'd rather you leave it than have it done not correctly. Yeah. So like, don't do, there's a few things you got to trust me on. And one of them is like, you can't just call whoever you found on Google. Yes. There's just a, very few people that do the whole containment and remediation really well. Yeah. So back to your story, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that's so important and relevant to everybody listening. So back to, you opened it up, he got way worse, was in bed. You Did you get sick at that time too? Yes. Yeah, so I was having migraines, anxiety, insomnia. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure between the fact that my kid is sick and I'm a doctor and I should be able to figure this out. Um, and then, um, and then the mold itself, I'm, you know, mold sensitive, very mold sensitive. Um, but so once we figured it out, um, we, you know, could begin the cleanup process. We had to move out and everything. And then we sold the house. I didn't, yeah. I was like, I, 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 Enough. I, I mean, yeah, I'm not living in here. I, I don't believe with that amount of water under the house that we could ever clean this. So, um, so we moved and um, I moved into a place nearby and my son started getting better almost immediately. So he, he had some shifts on a couple of weeks of binders mm -hmm. and then, um, then he went on antifungals and we moved out and then he just, he got, he got better mm -hmm. as this nine month migraine went away. Wow. It amazing. Yeah. It was incredible. And, and then it was, you know, it was a pretty quick recovery. He's a kid. So, yeah. you know, he still had the line things and he still needed more rest, but he was, he's also very driven. Yeah. Um, exactly. you know, very kind of athletic. So he was like determined to get back in the game. Like That's amazing. And what you mentioned here is really common too. I'm sure you see the same thing. I feel like there's tens of thousands of people walking around that have gotten bit by spiders or ticks or some arachnoid that carried a vector like Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia, Ehrlichia, and they're fine. So why is yeah. it that there's an important point here because what often happens exactly. if someone's walking around, they have Lyme and they're fine. They don't need treatment. Not everybody who has that. I think if we tested the whole population, we'd find 10 times the number of cases that we're treating because their immune system is robust enough to keep that bug in check, right? But then you throw a person like that into a moldy environment like your son who is otherwise robust and healthy and mold is a known immunotoxin. So it weakens the immune state in many levels. And then that weakened state allows for these old infections to pop up and start causing symptoms. So what you just told us was once he was out of the mold, the Lyme was less of an issue, almost a non-issue in some ways, right? Yes, and it's so funny and interesting to listen to you because that's almost the exact same speech I give my patients. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell them, and, and I make up numbers here, yeah, but, but I say, like, imagine we did an Igenix or a DNA connections of, you know, test on a random sampling of the population of the Northeast. My guess is some 90% yes. might have exposure and yes. some less than 10% are chronically ill. So what's what has, you know, Lyme take one person down and somebody else had a little febrile illness that was, you know, a week or two and did fine. And so, you know, I always talk to my patients about Lyme and biotoxin illness is that you sort of like, you want your whole system to be optimized and strong and like way up here and then the bugs to be dormant and on the ground and not active and, and um, mold will sort of tip that system, I feel more intensely than anything else. Yes. Now, gut dysfunction will, toxic burden, heavy metals, all that stuff. But if if there's mold, I feel like they'll never get better from the line. Patients just hurts and hurts. Mm -hmm. And so I always deal with the, the mold first in a line um, patient. 
Yeah, I love that. We are so aligned. <laughs> this is neat. I knew we'd have it. So, so son got better. You got better. You moved. Um, and then since then, no, any major other exposures or incidents? Has it been pretty? Uh, yeah, I've had a few. I feel like um, I feel like those of us that are mold sensitive and have had a big exposure, they tend to kind of follow us. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> All my patients are like, oh, how am I ever going to find a place? I'm like, you yeah. will. It just, you will. <laughs> it all does happen. And yeah. it's kind of everywhere. Your resiliency around it will get better. And what I've really learned is that, you know, mold will still happen. Not nothing as bad as that. I mean, I have had some other big, bad exposures that were hard, um, but I know what to do now. Like I know how to take care of it. I know how to take care of myself. I know the signs, you know, all of that. So, um, so it feels like it doesn't feel so out of control anymore. You know, like I can, I, I know how to deal with that. And I don't, my, my autonomic nervous system doesn't freak out if there's, you know, maybe I'm walking into a moldy space any longer. I love that. So, so similar pathway because I feel too, a lot of people say, well, is it possible to get well and, and still travel and do that? And now of course with COVID, we're not traveling, but um, right. I, in the last several years, since my mold exposure, mine was mostly in 2014 and before. Um, and in the beginning I was highly sensitive. It was hard to go to hotels and stuff. And now, um, I mean, I've gone to Maui and had horrible mold exposures. And I, like you said, the key is I want, I teach patients to find their symptoms that they know this is a mold exposure. Everybody's different. Yeah. Yeah. You have a little sinus pressure and a headache. I'll be a little more foggy or tired, or um, there's one, if it's ketomium, I call it the narcoleptic mold because it makes me fall asleep. Like I literally <laughs> have to. Now I, I've been trying to figure out like, what is it? I think it actually causes a little bit of POTS because I get orthostatic. Oh, I mean, for those of you listening, I get low blood pressure and I can't stand up. I got to lay down because after I lay, but it's weird because that particular one is almost like always causes me the same it's a personality i think so it's like this the signature of what it causes so if you have been exposed and you can kind of learn like dr fox and i have of what it looks like how it feels to be exposed and then you know for me i take charcoal i get hydrated i maybe take a nap um, and usually if I'm not ongoingly being exposed within hours, I can feel better. And of course there's PC, there's glutathione. What are some tricks you found when you do get an exposure to get better quicker, quickly? Um, yeah, well, one thing I tell my patients is that the alarm bell is a gift. Mm -hmm. Like once you're hypersensitized, you won't stay that hypersensitized. Mm -hmm. But the last thing you want to do is end up in another place that's moldy and get really sick for two years before you figure it out. So think of those, that hypersensitization and those, those alarm bells, you, you know, they, they get nervous. They're never going to be able to enter a building, but really that's a, that's a helpful alarm bell. You're not going to end up where you were. You're going to take your binders and mm -hmm. you're going to get out of there. Um, but what do I, so I love IV, phosphatidylcholine and glutathione. So if I was to have a good exposure somewhere else, like I'd probably get an IV when I got back. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, then I travel with, I travel with binders just in case. And, you know, I try not to stay in the moldy space. And then, yeah. um, you know, when I get back, I'll do a lot of uh, glutathione and um, transfer factors and, you know, mm -hmm. the whole thing. Oh, I yeah. love that. Maybe we'll talk through in a minute. What's that? But it clears a lot quicker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I love that. In fact, I've even started to have a little travel. Um, again, I haven't traveled for a while, but I bought a travel like fog, just like a little portable fogging system. So if I ever was in a room and I couldn't leave, I could fog it and actually yeah. be a little clearer. So that's available if, if patients want that. Um, so let's talk about just like approach, a little bit of an approach to what would, so say someone comes in, you think they have mold, how would you approach basic uh, confirmation testing? And then let's talk a little bit about, about treatments. Okay. Um, so if I suspect mold, um, I, incur well, so I do the, the, am I allowed to say the names of the labs? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I do the real time, I prefer the real time labs. Um, but I, and then the reason is, is because I do it provoked. So I do an IV, a phosphatidylcholine and glutathione. Perfect. And both of those things pull out mycotoxins, the toxins that molds to create neurotoxins, pull them out into the urine. Um, and then I have them wait an hour and then give the urine sample. Um, 
And the reason for that, for the listeners, is just that people that don't, people that detox mold well, don't get sick from it. So they don't, they're not the ones ending up in my office. So if I just do a urine sample, you know, if they're detoxing it well and pulling it out in the urine, they're probably not going to get as sick from it as the people that genetically don't, you know, pull it out well. So the, I find that, you know, like there used to be, like I used to have all these patients that I knew it was mold, like they knew they had an exposure and they had all the symptoms and I would do the test and the test would end up being negative. And then I finally learned, you know, if I do the IV first, um, that like somebody that was negative would have an ochratoxin A of 10 or 12 yeah. after an IV. And so, so that's my preferred way of doing it is uh, it's not cheap between the IV and the, and the test. So um, I prefer that one. And if that, um, if they can't do that or it doesn't work to get an IV or they, um, you know, don't live nearby or whatever, then I also use the Great Plains Labs urine mycotoxin. I like that one a lot too. Um, and I use that on kids because, you know, I don't want to force them through an IV. You can get an oat test too, which is organic acids. I like that you can get those two together. Oh yeah. yeah. You can get both. Yes. So. Um, Vibrant, I don't and, use them, but Vibrant has a mycotoxins too. And I, yeah, I use Vibrant a little bit. I've used it here and there. I don't have a ton of experience with it yet. Are you using it? I am. I'm really liking, I feel like I get a little bit more accuracy on the Ketomium and Stacky than I do on the Great yeah. Plains or the real time. Oh, nice. And so, what, but I'm playing with all of them. Like they're all good tests. So if you're listening and your yeah. doctor uses one, they're all good as long as you know what you're doing. Yeah. And I yeah. agree with real time. You need to um, um, provoke. Great Plains says don't provoke. Yeah. Vibrant says you probably don't need to. The Vibrant's actually most sensitive. So you could get a false positive, meaning you don't really have mold illness, but you're catching such a sensitivity from maybe we talk about food exposures. Usually these are not food exposures. You and I know that. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the error with Vibrant is it's so accurate. Could it be picking up people who really don't have a lot of toxicity? So sensitive, a little less. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But you're enjoying it. How does it compare yeah. price wise? I think they're all the same, except real time might still be just a pinch higher. <laughs> they went down on their pricing. Oh, perfect. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, and so then I book. will do if the patient has. Um, uh, insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. um, I'll do some of the biomarkers. And um, so I usually do a C4A and MMP9. I'll do a C3A too. Um, and then, you know, depending on their insurance and what I'm thinking, if I might add the VIP and the MSH and the yeah. TGF beta 1. Um, the main reason I do those are, are for two different reasons. I mean, one is that I can, if their insurance is good, I can follow C4As that were through the roof yes. and MMP9s without charging, without the patient yeah. having to pay a whole bunch and get a little, you know, some data point to see how we're doing. Because this always takes a lot longer than patients think. Yes, yes. Or that I wish that it would for them or even that I think it's going to sometimes. And so... You know, you don't want to have to repeat one of those mycotoxin tests yes. every few months. Yeah. And then, like you said, well, we know that's measuring excretion. So say you get a patient, you diagnose them, and you're treating them by helping them excrete. So that right. for so six that months, times 10. Yeah, it's going to go up and then patients are going to be confused. And I mean, we can explain it. We know what's going on, but I don't even do it that for six months again, unless they beg. And I said, well, it's going to be higher if we're doing the right thing because you're excreting. So just if you're listening and you've got a higher test after doing the protocol and you're like, what's going on? I'm getting worse. No, you're measuring excretion. So it's yeah. really critical here to understand that. And then the markers you mentioned, I just want to clarify if you're listening. So she said C4A, C3A. I love those. Those are split complement products that show an active level of inflammation. And C4A in particularly is usually good for recent acute exposure. So those can definitely go up and down within weeks. And then some of the other Sears markers are TGF beta, MMP9, MSH, um, ADH nosmolality. I still like to use if possible. And then VIP. Um, I think those are the main ones, but those can be, I agree, they're often covered and they can be super helpful to follow um, as the patient yeah. recovers, but they take a long time. Yeah. And, and if they're not covered, I usually don't bother unless the diagnosis is um, iffy. So if they get a negative mold test, 
and you're, they know they had a big mold exposure and you're really suspicious, of, then the C4A becomes real helpful and the MMP9 and some of the others. And then I'll have them do a SERS questionnaire. Mm -hmm. So if the C4A is up and then this SERS questionnaire and there's a known mold exposure, I'll usually go ahead and treat. Yeah. You know? And start with the real benign parts of treatment. Just totally to agree. Because the great thing about mold detox, it's detox. So we all are toxic. And there's almost no harm. I mean, people have asked with the mold detox box, can I use it if I have heavy metal toxicity or if I have just general environmental toxicity? And the truth is the basics of detox, which we'll talk about in a minute, they cover detox. And so usually you don't hurt someone by helping them detox better, even if they don't have mold. <laughs> yes, I agree. Uh, I so agree. then what would you do? Say you have someone, you have all the markers, you think they have mold illness. Um, what would be kind of your basic um, protocol to get people yeah. well? Well, I'd like to preface that just by saying that every patient is different and they have a gen different genetic ability to detox, biotoxin, mycotoxin. Um, and so, you know, there is a basic protocol and then, you know, there's all the yes. different variations for all our very unique patients. Um, but first of all, you always have to get them out of the moldy house you know, of course, and that can sometimes be the very hardest part um, of the whole journey. And then, um, so I use the different strains that show up on the, um, on the test result, if I, if I have a good mycotoxin from any of those labs. Mm -hmm. And so I do binders specific to the different strains. Um, and then um, I do, I usually do uh, BEI. I do the nasal spray, the intraconazole EDTA nasal spray, antifungal nasal spray from Hopkinton's or with some, one of the other pharmacies. Um, and then I don't add in biofilm stuff until the very end because I find some of them it'll tank them and they're not ready to open up biofilm yet. So, and when I start the binders, I have them start one at a time and find their dose. So work their way up slowly. For example, so if they, you know, they have some trichothecenes and I want to start some activated charcoal, I'll have them just start with like one capsule or even less and make sure that feels okay. And then, and then go up to four, you know, if, if it feels good and the system feels better. But as we've all seen some patients um, you mobilize too much, things begin to actually excrete, but they move around and people get sicker. Um, and so you always have to kind of be careful for that percentage of the population that has to go really slow and take very small bits. But um, so yeah, so I do binders for the different strains. Um, do you want me to go through which binders? Yeah, I was gonna say, lots of people would love to hear. So you mentioned trichosethenes and charcoal. I do the same yeah. and that's probably, is there okay. anything else you would do for the T2 yeah. toxins? Yeah, so um, for gliotoxin, I use mostly bentonite clay. Um, and then for ochratoxin A, I try cholestyramine, if, especially mm -hmm. if that's their biggest one. Yeah. You know, if, if there's a lot of it and it's not just a little, um, I try cholestyramine. I'll offer them both the drugstore variety with the nasty high fructose yeah. <laughs> and, um, and or, or the you know clean compounded stuff. Um, if they can't tolerate it, and you know not everybody can tolerate cholesterol, um, then I switch to OptiFibrilene, mm -hmm. um, or I'll do um, Ultra Binder, so Quicksilver's mm -hmm. Ultra Binder, like two teaspoons of that. Um, kind of heaping teaspoons, yeah. kind of a big, big dose. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and, um, and that'll usually do it for the ochratoxin A. And then, um, and then sometimes once I've got them, or like, for example, if I have a patient who doesn't have a positive mycotoxin test, but has an elevated C4A and a history and all of that, um, I might start them on something more like GI detox that has a little bit of everything or the ultra binder that has a little bit of everything. Um, but if I do have a good result, I try to target the binders. Mm, I uh, love that. And I totally agree. And it's been great to kind of start to get more and more data 
Um, and I know with ICI, which we're both part of, they're going to do some studies on specific, like we just talked about the companies that do urinary mycotoxin testing, and we're just giving our opinions. <laughs> That's all. These are great labs. So any of the labs are good. But what we're hoping to have, if you stay tuned, um, is actual data on the like head to head comparison in the same patients and the same population. So we can know which one is actually more accurate, because at this point, we don't. You know, we just trust that the lab is good and they give us decent results to proceed, but there may be one of those companies that's a lot better than another. Right, right. And I use transfer factors. Mm -hmm. Do you use the Enviro transfer that's factors? That's what I was going to ask. The Enviro, I really like for the mold. Yeah, um, yeah I the, like that. I think it works great. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so uh, I use drainage remedies in all my mold patients. So kidney, liver, lymph, mm -hmm. detoxification to help all your detox. You like Pacana or under, or what kind of brand? I use Pacana, okay. um, but you know, I have no necessary yeah. preference. They're all great. Any Anything that's gonna open up all your detox. You know, we talk about, I, I always talk to my patients when they're this sick and they've got neuropathies and chronic fatigue mm -hmm. and fibromyalgia and all these things that, and a, a lot of times in the mold patients, you, you sort of know there's some underlying Lyme because they yeah. have the flu-like mm -hmm. and the migratory joint pain and the stuff that's like, you know, maybe some ear hunger and things yes. that you go, okay, this isn't just mold, but let's treat the mold first and see what yeah. happens. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I, no, I forget what I was saying. Um, you said some of these have Lyme, but let's do the mold first. And then, and the drainage is huge because like you oh, said, yeah, the drainage yeah. So, so I like the Pecana, but you know, there's a lot of different, um, brands that do organ detox. Oh, what I was saying was that I always sort of say between the Lyme and the mold, the biotoxin, neurotoxin, mycotoxin, plus we live in a very toxic world, like all those other toxic and the total toxic burden is like falling over and onto yes. the floor at this point. <laughs> and you have to kind of get it up off the floor before you might even feel that much different. And, yeah. and so the binders are doing that and all that stuff is doing that. And then part of it is opening up the channels from the other side so that you can just begin pulling everything out. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's our binders, pulling it out in the stool and glutathione will help mm -hmm. to, um, you know, detox it so we can get it out in the urine and the stool. Um, and and yeah, so the, the drainage remedies are not so specific for mold, but they kind of help with everything and just beginning to open up your detox channels. Mm. Um, Tremendous. You know, I use glutathione. I use, I've been using glucuronidation support mm -hmm. a lot more lately, not in the very beginning. If they don't get where I want them to get to, um, or as quickly as I think they should be moving or getting better, then I add it in. So I'll just stop for a second and give a little tiny tutorial. Our liver, you've probably heard me say this before, and of course, Dr. Fox knows this very well. Phase one, phase two, you have a toxin that's converted into an intermediate, and then that intermediate is converted by phase two into something that's excretable. But if we get stuck with that intermediate between phase one and phase two, people feel way, way worse. And so something like glucuronidation, which is part of phase two, something like calcium deglucurate or support sulforaphanes and those, um, those can actually help that phase two so that people don't get stuck in the in-between that's actually more toxic than getting it out of the body. Yes, exactly. Fantastic. So we're, I can't believe how fast our time is going. But be, before we go, I want to talk just a little bit about limbic activation, trauma and mold. And if you address that, I feel like that's the next level that we're seeing for healing. Yeah. Um, so for people listening, what often happens is it's such, it's a traumatic thing and it's a physiological trauma. So even if you're emotionally stable and don't have an, you know, a, a depression, anxiety or other disorder, mold can be incredibly traumatic and it can cause kind of a PTSD to our systems where we get another exposure and we get this. And then it also affects the brain and the ability to self-regulate and the amygdala. So um, is there anything specific you found helpful for kind of down-regulating that fight or flight response? Uh, how would you address that in your patients? Yeah, um, so I, I find most of my patients that are chronically ill and have been sick for a long time, um, this is sort of critical mm -hmm. to their you know, healing path. And, and, you know, it's starting to become clear that maybe it needs to get added in earlier than, than I have been, or a lot of us have been adding it in. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I find that there's, 
I sort of, the way I describe it to my patients is, is there's a cellular memory um, and there's a feedback loop. So if you've been sick for years, when you go into a moldy environment and then you walk into a movie theater or a hotel room, your you know entire nervous system sends off these alarm bells. And then even if you get right out and you're probably fine and barely yeah. had any exposure at all, sometimes that feedback loop and that cellular memory is enough to like have the whole body think that it's under this much uh, stress again and that it's got this big exposure. And so you get all your symptoms back. And a lot of that's triggered by your anxiety and your fear around, oh no, I don't want to get sick again, right. which is the adrenal sort of limbic, um, vagal, you know, that whole thing. And, and there's that feedback loop that eventually has to get addressed and the really um, and I feel like I'm the ones that are really chronic and have been do, doing this yeah. for a long time. And so um, I like DNRS. Mm -hmm. um, I recommend that a lot. Um, I recommend the Gupta program. Um, I'm just learning about all the cool information on vagal, um, mm -hmm. uh, vagal retraining and um, healing. And um, I don't know that like, I know there's some great books on it. Is there a program to refer a patient to for them? The That's a great question. Cause there's like vagal nerve stimulators. There's like some, they're not that I know of. There's not like one program. And often I'll use like a somatic based trauma therapist. So some yeah. professional who walks them through EMDR or thought field therapy or brain spotting. Those are all ways that yeah. but totally you're right. There's like, no, I don't know that there's yeah. Uh, and if I find one, I'll put a link here. But I don't think, yeah. So that was my that was my last um, thing. Was I actually still recommend a lot of EMDR and um, brain spotting, and that's because some people will do a lot better if they're handheld and they're walked through. And I I, I just happen to know some incredible yeah. providers in town that um, that are so good at EMDR and that can help break those patterns. Um, really well. So a lot of times I'll do that too. We are so lucky because again, like you and I do this all the time and there's two of us and there's more people in, in our area. And like yeah. in some places there's, there's no one who knows how to treat mold. So we're so lucky that we have, you know, each other here and many other colleagues again that do this. And I love hearing you because there's like almost every step of the way we're so aligned <laughs> with how we, we approach it. It feels really familiar, yeah. same exact kind of thing. Um, but we also have a ton of resources in Boulder, Colorado for somatic therapies. Like we have, you name it, it's probably here in some form. And even I found like a cranial sacral therapy and some of these can also be really helpful because it's just, there's always like these DNRS program, amazing, but you go, you commit, you do the program. And sometimes the type A's who are already a little OCD from the mold, um, it's one more thing to do. And um, it's great, but I love these like passively receptive things like biurinal beats, um, cranial sacral therapy, uh, and even just massage, like human touch. And some of these things that are a little bit more gentle, receptive, because it yeah. can the nervous system too. Um, yeah. Very cool. Any other um, tips or tricks or things that you would like to leave uh, the people listening with if they've been exposed to mold and they're struggling? Um, what would be your parting words of advice? Oof, if you've been to exposed to mold, um, some of the things I would say is don't think that you're crazy. Mm -hmm. um, it's less than less than a quarter of the population is sensitive to mold, so you could very well be very sick from your house, and none of, nobody else in the house is sick. Yeah. Um, and you know, you can go to ICI, the organization that um, Jill and I are both uh, members of, and look for a practitioner in your area. But, um, you know, don't, uh, don't think you're crazy and have faith and you can get better. And I actually personally think it's um, not at all the worst diagnosis in the world. I think it's fairly easy. I mean, it's a complicated protocol when you really get into it all. But I think it's fairly easy to treat in the sense that people get better pretty quickly um, as long as they're not being currently exposed. And um, yeah, and just just have faith that you'll find somebody that knows what they're doing with mold, and and uh, people get better. 
Love that. Cause I agree. It, it feels like it's an overwhelming thing. If you're listening and you're in the midst of it, it might, you were like, Oh, you guys are crazy. <laughs> this is so hard. Um, and we've both experienced it. So we know how hard it is, but we're on the other side and I'm, I am not, in, uh, I can still tell when I get exposed, but it doesn't take me down. I don't feel like it's been a permanent thing that has caused a handicap. And that's exciting because I can tell you listening, if you're experiencing it now that there's hope and same with Dr. Fox. Um, so where can people listening find you, find more about you? Where's your website? Where's your home? Um, yeah, so boulderholistic.com. And then I have a, I have a Instagram and a Facebook page. Do you want me to just send those to you? Yes, I will send links. And yes, please, if you aren't following both of us on Instagram and all that, we'll make sure and get you guys the links. I don't know about you, Dr. Fox, but that ends up being a lot of where I put the fun information, the blogs and stuff. So if you're yeah. not a newsletter. I'm in and out of using the social media a lot. I've yeah. had a lot of phases where I get in it and then I stop. Well, it's kind of the bane, right? Like people are using it as a great way to get information out, but I don't love being on there. So yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you for taking time out on your Tuesday afternoon to talk to us. And I'll be sure and include those links. And thank you everybody so much for joining us today. And Jill, thank you so much for the work that you do and how committed you are and for the support and the research and all the things that you do for all the other professionals in our community that are doing what we do. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome.